When I was studying this week's gospel reading, I realized that that story that we read between the disciples, the exorcist, and Jesus has pretty much the same context that we're in today, just with different situations and different work. So the disciples see someone casting out demons in Jesus' name. But this person isn't a disciple like the other disciples. This disciple isn't a part of their group. And in my head, because my mind works this way, I like to think this exorcist is from Texas. And maybe they just kind of embrace this identity, and they wear the cowboy boots and the cowboy hat and the belt buckle. And that exorcist casts out the demons in Jesus' name. They say, go on now, get! I said, get! But the disciples, they're uncomfortable with the exorcist. And they're uncomfortable because the exorcist doesn't follow Jesus the same way that they do. They think that their way of following Jesus is the only right way. So they tell Jesus that they tried to stop him. And maybe, maybe by doing this, they thought they'd earn some like bonus disciple points or something. But Jesus doesn't affirm the actions that they said they tried to take. He affirms the exorcist. And verse 41 seems to point that the affirmation isn't simply because of the act of the exorcist trying to cast out the demons, but because it's done in service to Christ. So Jesus affirms somebody that's not a disciple in the same way the other disciples are. For serving in Jesus' name, even though they do it in a way that kind of makes everybody uncomfortable. Then right after this story, we're given this really kind of scary lesson on sin. Jesus talks about it's better to lose your hand, your foot, and even your life than it is the sin. And this is kind of an important distinction because we don't want to chop something off every time we do something wrong or we're tempted to do something wrong. Otherwise, you know, Jesus turns into the best second-hand sword salesman in history, and we really know better than that. Jesus is saying that there's real consequences to sin. Consequences that are just as dire as losing a limb, or even our lives. But why? Why say all this following the exorcist story, and use limbs and millstones as an example? Verse 42 starts, If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me. Jesus is pointing to the relational aspects of what sin does to humanity. We have a connection to God in everything that we do. God is our creator, our redeemer, our friend, and our companion as we go throughout life. And when we sin, it hurts that relationship. But God has promised to love and forgive us anyway. But there's also another dimension to this scripture that is almost rhetorical. You see, when we sin against one another, it hurts both our relationships with God and one another as well. And that's a really serious thing, just as serious as cutting off one's own foot or hand. And I'm not saying all this to try to make it a guilt trip, because we've all sinned, we have all need God's forgiveness, but the good news is, is that God does, has, and currently forgives us. And we're freed from the power of sin because of that love that God gives us. But the question is, is what do we do in knowing that? Because it's easy to say, or rather feel, then get into a habit of acting like, well, I'm covered, and then go about our lives like nothing happened. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of temptation in the world to do that. And sometimes that may look like something very blatant, and other times it may look like treating our faith like a to-do list. Sunday worship, check. Praying, check. On to the next thing. But you know what? I'm guilty of that too. And sometimes we just go through the motions of being a Christian instead of feeling the relationship that we have with God and one another. But there'll always be a next thing to do on our to-do list. But here, 
in this moment, Jesus is telling us that sin is serious, a serious thing. And so too are our relationships with God and one another. Because we're the little ones in verse 42 who believe it. But according to the passage, as a double-edged sword, pun kind of intended, but we're not going to be chopping anything off because we've already gone over that already, it means we must be mindful of sinning against one another as well. As mindful as we are about sinning against God. I had a friend that I allowed an argument to come between us. And honestly, I don't even really remember what the argument was because it was a really small thing that hurt our relationship. But we really didn't talk about it after it happened. We really didn't talk at all. And I'll be honest, I knew that I was supposed to make amends. I knew I was supposed to forgive and overlook the argument so our relationship with one another could be more holy. But I didn't. And unfortunately, I can't now because he passed away unexpectedly. And this friend wasn't a distant friend that I can make excuses for either. So he was the best man at my wedding, and I the best man at his. And I would love to say that it was a long time ago, and studying to be a pastor somehow makes me immune to you know making mistakes like that. But it wasn't that long ago, and quite obviously I'm not immune to it. Any more than anybody else is. But at the same time, I also know that I'm not the only one that has a story like this. And maybe your story differs. But I also know that I'm forgiven, and I don't need to dwell on that anymore because I have faith and trust in a God who not only forgives me, but also takes care of my friend in ways that I can't even possibly begin to imagine. But sin still hurts. It can feel like losing a part of yourself, and it can feel like death is being dealt into relationships. Yet God redeems, and our relationships don't have to have that death being dealt into. And this is one of those moments in my own life where I can see God very plainly. And I still miss my friend. But how much more now do you think I pay attention to how I handle disagreements? I can see how much more connected we all are, not just between friends, but as a congregation, and even complete strangers who have never met. This congregations argue too. And the arguments themselves aren't necessarily bad things. Differing opinions and perspectives are much more valuable than we give them credit. But how we argue and handle our relationships with one another really matters. So may we never allow our differences to drive us away from the love that we're called to show one another. Switching a little bit, Jesus closes this passage by talking about salt. And salt's really interesting because, especially in Jesus' time, it can preserve things, and it makes things last longer, keeps things from going bad, kind of like you know, modern-day refrigeration. But in this time, too, salt can also be weaponized, which it was quite often and put into the ground so nothing could ever grow. What an interesting metaphor for people. Huh? Simultaneously good and bad, preserving and destructive, sinner and saint. We can build one another up, or we can tear one another down. And my friends and I will kind of competitively smack talk one another in a friendly way. But in these circles, if someone asks if you're salty, it means something completely different. <laughs> but in thinking about this, I guess we're kind of always salty. It just depends on how we apply our saltiness relationally with God and with one another. And like the disciples, we're not always going to agree with how one another serve. But we all are called to serve. And if we follow Jesus' example here, we're called to build one another up even when they don't serve in the same way that everybody else does. And that's a lot easier said than done. Because sometimes it's not easy to see someone serving God in their actions, especially if they're making you angry. But sometimes, even as we're members of the same family, we argue and we fight over countless things. But our calling is all the same. 
And we're called to follow Jesus' example in recognizing the goodness in one another, the goodness in serving. Because like it or not, we all are part of the same family. And sinning against one another is kind of like chopping off our own hands and feet. But thanks be to God that we're forgiven for that. And thanks be to God that we are free to pursue the relationships with God and with one another. So may we remember Jesus' reply to the disciples regarding the Texorcist. May we follow Jesus' example and forgive one another as we have been forgiven first. And may we stay salty and work to preserve our relationships with God and one another. And how we do each of these things and how we, it'll vary and we'll argue about it. So let me close by asking a question. And I would encourage everybody something I discovered about myself. The question that always makes me the most uncomfortable is the one I need to ask myself the most. How will you stay salty and preserve your relationship? What does Jesus' reply to the disciples say to you in your own life? And how would it look like for you to forgive that person that you need to, even if it's yourself. May you wrestle with these questions and know that God is with you as you do so. Amen.